Welcome to RugbyLeagueHub.com's White Line Fever. I'm Steve Mascord and uh, with me again, Jimmy Smith. How are you, Jimmy? Stevie, I'm very well. We've seen a very good game of footy tonight as an improved performance from the Broncos, but I think there'll be a lot of disappointment in the Broncos football department about the performance of the referee. Yeah, 20 to 18 it was uh, Manly over Brisbane up at, uh, at what used to be North Power Stadium, Central Coast Stadium. and uh, Blue Tongue Stadium. The- <laughs> Before the giant crowd of, I think, 178, uh, which is great to see fans back in um, games in, uh, in Australia now. And, of course, uh, Brisbane, for those who didn't watch, um, Brisbane led uh, 18-0. Yeah. And were run, run down and overtaken 20-18. to 18. Uh, So pretty disappointing uh, from, from the point of view of Anthony Seabold, but a, a better result than 59-0 last week. Yeah. Um, Jimmy... You said Anthony Seabold, the coach of the Broncos, would be uh, uh, upset, disappointed. What, are, what do you reckon things will upset him? I think there was a lot of moments, in, very particular moments within the course of the game where the, the decision clearly went to the home side. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know whether it was the influence of that 178 or not, but uh, whatever happened, happened. Um, there was a try disallowed uh, to Darius Boyd where I think it's very clear that Daly Cherry Evans threw himself on the ground and yet still he got away with the fact that he was impeded by... Um, a, a lead runner in the eyes of the video referee. I thought that was a really poor decision. A minute later, Manly scored their first try. So instead of being 24-0 up, they're up 18-4 at half time. Uh, and then the turnaround happened in the second half. And I think at one point it was seven straight penalties in a row to Manly. Um, and I don't know how many more six agains were in there, which is a you know another big stat that needs to be um, collated along with penalties. So there was just a period of the game where I, I just uh, you know I, I think the referee was refereeing one side, and it's probably a little bit disappointing to be saying that. Um, still a really entertaining game of footy, but I think the referee had too much impact on the outcome of the game. They're very well known as being an intimidating crowd. Those one hundred and seventy six <laughs> people in the corporate boxes. <laughs> 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 at Central Coast Stadium, they're absolutely ferocious. But, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously the Broncos are, along with the Dragons and the Bulldogs, uh, you know, the, the club's under a lot of scrutiny because of the, the, the recent results. Um, I mean, Anthony Seabold, I guess, will be feeling that pressure as much as Paul McGregor um, or Dean Pay. So uh, does that make him personalise what happened today a little bit, Jimmy? Does he start to, does he start to feel the sort of personal pressure on top of the the pressure that the team's under? And does that impact on his response to what happened, you know? Uh, potentially, absolutely. Because I think one thing about Anthony Seabold is he, he is a, a, an emotional type coach and he can be, especially with the media, I think he tends to have a very prickly relationship with the media, Anthony Seabold, which has sort of been generated, not of his doing, but it's been um, continued by Anthony Seabold. Which it's a really funny, funny relationship that he has um, uh, with media in general, but especially the Brisbane media ever since he was named as, as Wayne Bennett's successor. So um, I, I think that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, he, um, you know, it was a great coaching performance, really, to get his side to be playing so well. And, and that would probably disappoint him more than anything. And, and the, the thing about it is, you know, I think the referees get to a point where they say, hang on a minute. Manly are a really good side and a lot of people saying they can win the competition. This side that they're playing against were beaten 59-0 last week and now they're going to be up 24-0? Like that, that doesn't quite seem right. So it's very hard to not let that premeditation come into play. Um, and see, as a result of that, you know, as I said, I think they got some tough decisions. And then, then beyond that, I think, yes, you get an emotional response from the coach because he's been under so much pressure. You know, Steve... I don't know whether you've been following it much, but that you know, the the northern media especially have been salivating about how the Broncos legends have turned on the club and they're no longer invited for a barbecue and that wouldn't happen in Wayne's day and uh, you know all that sort of stuff. So you know that's enormous pressure for uh, a job that's already highly pressured. Yeah, I, I've got to say from my perspective, you know, watching the game um, in between tweeting for at League Hub Com. Which you, which you can follow us on Twitter, um, nice. was, that, was that the Broncos were kind of, you know, probably in a, in, a, in a way startled that they had an 18-0 lead over Manly for the same reasons you said the referee subconsciously might be. 
And then in the second half, there was a bit, there was an aspect of deer in the headlights and they did, they did run out of puff um, a little bit. Um, you know, um, I thought the commentators made, uh, um, you know, past comment about them not going to the air when they thought that they were having some, um, some success there. Um, so, you know, I didn't, I thought I had this sort of feeling from pretty much the fifth minute of the second half, fourth minute of the second half, that Manly were just, this is a white knuckle ride now for, for the Broncos. That, that this, what happened didn't really surprise me that they were run down and overtaken. So um, I, I can't say, although you know, various individual decisions might have gone against, um, uh, against uh, the Broncos, I, I can't say that it was that surprising how the, the rest of the game, the final 35 minutes of the game, uh, played out. But uh, um, now, Jimmy, how much do you know about, did it cost more to get in? Was it like kind of like scalpers? They've got, they've got the only 173 tickets to this guy, this gig, and um, I can charge whatever I want. Was it, was, it just, was it just random? If you were a corporate box holder at Manly who lived on the Central Coast, you got a ticket at normal price or were they charged extra? Do you know much about that? Or what was um, Really good question around the pricing on that. I'm not 100% sure. And I know you're saying this with tongue firmly planted in cheek, <laughs> but um, uh, it was the corporate sponsors that were given access to it. Remember, it's a Thursday night and it's at, not a brookie, you know, it's up on the Central yeah. Coast. Um, so uh, there's that part to it too. But the people who were um, invited to come along were the longest serving members. So, you know what, I'm, I'm in, in a way, in and it's really difficult to determine who you should invite along. I reckon those people who have stuck solid with you for the longest period of time deserve to be at the front of the queue. So that's the way it played out. What they paid, I don't know. But um, I think there was the time back in the day, and I certainly remember from the Cootamundra Bulldogs, um, but uh, even the Canterbury-Bankstown Bulldogs, they would announce a gate, right? You wouldn't announce a crowd, you announce a gate. How much money was taken at the gate. Um, I don't think they were announcing that tonight at Gosford. <laughs> now, um, nice segue, well, not a nice segue, a clunky one, but if going from the NRL into the recommendations of the Rules Committee here in, uh, in England uh, in the early hours this morning, I saw the press release at about 6 a.m. Uh, and, and I saw that they were adopting the NRL rule changes and I and duly went back to sleep uh, and then woke up and there was a bit of a Twitter storm and it was because they buried the lead uh, which, which is, you know, that's the way things work when you're a governing body. But um, the other thing they're looking at doing, the recommendation is to abolish scrums uh, for the rest of the season uh, in Super League. Now, it's, it's just a, um, it's been asked to be considered. It's not a cast iron recommendation and certainly not a decision, Jimmy. But the thinking behind it's very interesting. I had a chat to some people at the RFL before I came on and, and we'll discuss that. Um, after I get your reaction to, to that news. Given the fact that Cole Flanagan has been packing into the front row in scrums for the Sydney Roosters uh, at one stage this year, um, given the fact I saw tonight Joel Thompson in the second row, not even put his arms around the front rower. He just, just sort of leaned on him like this uh, during the course of a scrum. I don't think there's any doubt that, you know, that the, the chance for a win against the feed um, the chance to, for, you know, push the team off the ball, which is all the things that, you know, 20 years ago you might have thought about doing. That, those things aren't there. So essentially what you're doing, um, and this is what was really interesting with the NRL, um, with their new rules this year about you had the option of taking the scrum wherever you like, you, you start to say, okay, why? Why are they taking the scrum in the centre? Why are they taking the scrum to the right or to the left and you go, oh, okay, they're trying to get this player one-on-one -on -one with this player. You know, they, they know that this player has extreme pace and if they can isolate that defender, then that's a bit of a mismatch that they're looked at. So um, I understand it from that point of view. What's their alternative? Like, do you, you know, I think that's a good part of the game from an attacking point of view is when there's a whole lot of people out of the way. You know, it's almost like let's have a game of nines, but just for one play. Um, and and that's the number of that's the amount of space that's available to attacking players. So, if if the RFL said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to just get the six players to isolate, self isolate within one point five meter <laughs> region of each other. Um, Twelve of them are going to stand in a certain in a certain space, and then the rest of them are going to give the opportunity to attack. You know, uh, it, it's it's a little bit out there, but that I can accept. 
if they just do a handover and, okay, let's restart it again and defensive lines are set exactly like they would be from a, a, a turnover or a, or a, a, a tap restart, then I, I think the game misses something. Yeah, well, okay. Well, from what I've been told, um, this is being 100% dictated by Health England. Right. Um, and the, the estimation is that their, a tackle is one uh, high-risk contact. It's been um, estimated um, that a scrum has 132 high-risk contacts. Um, there's some sort of uh, mathematical equation at work there. I don't know what it is. And from what I can, I'm told, Health uh, England have said that if one forward tests positive um, uh, uh, between matches, then every single forward he packed into a scrum with the previous game would be put in isolation for two weeks. So really, they've been, uh, they've been placed in a position where they haven't really got a lot of choice but to at least put this idea on the table. Um, Health England and the English government aren't interested in what the rules are at the NRL. They don't have a, a, an idea on six again for a ruck infringement. Health England, they don't why really not? care. You can do what you like there. Why not? You can why, do what you why, like there. why don't Health England have an idea on that? <laughs> this is but, a tragedy. But, but apparently also um, there is anecdotal evidence uh, through uh, uh, athletes in other sports going back to training that once a week you will have a positive here and there. You will have a positive here and there. So the, the concern is not just getting back on the field from the point of view of Super League, it's staying back on the field. Yep. And if, 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 the, if the government is going to basically take um, 12 players out of play every time a forward test positive and, and a whole team is going to be therefore banned from playing uh, for two weeks, then the view is that um, getting rid of scrums is, is a small price to pay. And now I actually think it's very interesting because we, as you alluded to, Jimmy, the scrum in rugby league is not really a contest um, at the moment. Yes. And so, um, so it isn't a huge loss. Um, and I know that in rugby union, uh, they have talked about getting rid of scrums uh, when they return in, in this country as well. And it would have a much bigger impact on their game. I mean, rucks and malls have to be a massive, uh, you know, rucks and malls have to be a massive, a consideration in this as well. well I think they if, can if, see if, you doing this, Jimmy. Really? We're on TV. They yeah. can see you doing <laughs> So Rugby Union can't come back if that's the case because they do rucks and malls um, every time there's a breakdown, right? So if what you're saying is there's 132 points um, in a scrum compared to one point in a tackle, then within a ruck, there's 50 or 60, right? So... Um, <clears throat> That's the concern for rugby union um, from a rugby league point of view. Um, uh, and that's the calm we breathe here in Australia, right? When we've had 100 deaths for COVID-19 and everyone else, uh, well, the UK's had 40,000. So that changes the way you think and understandably so. You know, we are going through a restart of the NRL much earlier than most people anticipated and touch wood, no player. You know, it's a massive story here when Benji Marshall kisses Michelle Bishop, uh, Bishop on the cheek. Um, and breaks the isolation, and yet they're both sent for testing and no one comes back with uh, um, a, a positive test. But that's the biggest story. I can only imagine what would happen if someone did test positive for COVID-19. Um, so, we're, you know, there's a real calm that we breathe and we're worried about the second wave. I don't know whether you saw the news, but someone at the um, Black Lives Matter protest in Melbourne tested positive for COVID. So all of those people who were involved in that protest are now being asked to self-isolate for the next 14 days. Yeah. So, um, yeah. you know, that's, that's the type of thing that, uh, that rugby league have been lucky enough in this country, or this country's been lucky enough and rugby league's run off the back of it. Um, UK hasn't had that. Um, and that raises a really intriguing question, Jimmy, is in order for rugby union to come back, we'll have to introduce play the balls. I mean, you can imagine... <laughs> and drop you two players off the field. You can imagine the you can imagine the conversation. It's like, well, you know, why don't you just play the ball between your legs when you tackle uh, just for the rest of the year? And the yeah. number one objection to it would be no. It wouldn't be no. That's a terrible idea. Or it'd be no because rugby league's already doing it. We would become rugby league. So, and and, and this is a really interesting period in the evolution of sports, along with the evolution of so many sort of mechanisms and structures uh, in society. And you do wonder 
um, if scrums disappear from rugby league in this country, well, let me put it this way. If scrums disappeared from rugby league in Australia because the Australian government said that, that they can't happen for the rest of this year, there would be, there would be a strong case that they disappear forever. Now, why, because why, why would you waste why would you waste a crisis, as they say? You know, if if there's been a school of thought, and it only has to be a you know a twenty percent support, thirty percent support, that you know maybe we should do away with scrums. Why don't we try it? And then you can say, oh yeah, we tried it, and the reason we tried it was because it was much safer during the COVID period, um, but it had a negative impact on the game, so um, we actually went back to scrums. Or you say, because based on what we've got now with the six again rule and one referee, if COVID didn't happen, there is no way that would have been pushed through by the ARLC. No way in the world. But mm -hmm. because there was, okay, we're going, to have, um, we're going to have a quicker game. We want less contact. We want, um, um, I'm going to drop a referee. Why? Um, for financial reasons mostly, but let's hope it speeds up the game. We're not 100% sure. Um, why wouldn't you try not having scrums? And if it doesn't work, change it back. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great experiment, and um, and also as you say, I mean, of the of the experimental rules that are being tried in the NRL at the moment, are there any you think will change back at the end of the year, or do you think do you think that they've, they've all passed the litmus test? Uh, I think they've all passed the litmus test. We almost saw a twenty forty today, which would have been fascinating. I don't think we've seen a, a twenty forty. You know, the forty twenty, and and. By extension, if there's a 2040 and a 4020, why isn't there a 3030? Like, if you, if you can kick, no, I mean this seriously. If you can kick the ball 40 metres, right, and, and you need to do that to get your 4020 and your 2040, why, why, why have you excluded 3030? So if you kick it from your own goal, well, so you, it'll, now we're talking the opposite now. We're talking about rugby league looking more like rugby union. <laughs> guys right. catching the ball on their own. Guys <laughs> catching the ball on their own in goal and just kicking it. If they find touch just before halfway, they get a scrum feed. <laughs> so right. So, so, <laughs> so the, it's not about back where to Malcolm you, Knox's column. <laughs> yeah, it's not about where you, where you, um, that you have to kick from the 40 metre line. It's about if you can get a kick that goes 40 metres from where you kicked it to then go over the sideline, then... Um, Away you go. It's your ball. Interesting. Let's talk about that because um, I was talking to some rugby types about it and they were like, adamant it would never happen. Never happen. Um, never happen. Malcolm Knox wrote the article. You might background people. Uh, yeah. Malcolm Knox wrote an article saying it's a bit, which is something that comes up once a year. Someone writes about it. Why does, why are rugby league and rugby union separate now uh, when their biggest difference was professionalism? And they're both professional now. They've both got huge uh, amateur numbers as well. So the only reason they exist is buried in the mists of history. So he's saying, well, rugby union in Australia is, uh, is in trouble. Uh, so now is the time for, uh, for rugby league to, to, to run it, basically. And then, and then it's just a very interesting thought experiment. Um, the, you know, I did do a column about it on, on our website on rugbyleaguehub.com. The one thing I didn't mention in that, um, which is something because I've written it before, is that... I wouldn't follow a United Rugby. Uh, you know, I just wouldn't. Not cause, because I don't think what I like about rugby league is necessarily the aesthetics of it, uh, the actual thing. Um, you know, I think it's more what I like about it, what it stands for um, and, and the community that it makes me feel part of. So while I, I can almost support it on two counts, I can support it because it makes sense and I could support it because it would put a, about another six hours back into my week every week because I wouldn't watch it. So... So, you know, um, yeah, but anyway, uh, but that, that, that's kind of the debate that's going on at the moment. And obviously in Australia, um, it, um, um, it, it, it's in sharp relief because of yeah. the financial problems of, um, of, of the uh, rugby Australia. The, the, the issue around that is that there's only one country, oh, sorry, there's only one half of one country of 25 million people on the planet where rugby league is stronger than rugby union. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, and, and oh, every Papua other. New Guinea. Oh, sorry, Papua New Guinea. Yes, and the north of England, Yorkshire, Lancashire. But but it wouldn't work like that, would it, Jimmy? Basically, it, it's too big a thing to say they should both get back together because, and I think this is a self perpetuating obstacle with ongoing commercial agreements and, and television contracts that both codes have. You are collapsing. Rugby league would have to be in rugby league would have to be on its knees to the extent that rugby union is in Australia. Like it would have to have no sponsors, no TV contract um, um, in order for it to be absorbed by rugby union. Otherwise, 
uh, and no no government funding, which is an important one. So the, both codes get government funding uh, and, and government assistance in, in half a dozen countries. So you're saying, would those governments be willing to give the same amount to just one administration? No. So the, it, it is, there are too many self-perpetuating, uh, too many, too many um, agreements to unravel and commitments to unravel for, for a true merger to happen anytime soon. But what could happen would be that the NRL could simply treat rugby union like it treated um, um, touch football and absorb it. So the, the IRLC would run the existing rugby union domestic competitions. The IRLC would, would administer the Wallabies. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the IRLC would just um, um, run all rugby in Australia of both codes. That, that, that is not to, um, that, is, that is the only people standing in the way of that, Jimmy, are people like me who are so committed either way that they say, I wouldn't watch it if it happened. Uh, you know, and there's plenty of people on both sides saying that. And, and, there, and, that, and that is the only reason stopping a, a commercial agreement in Australia. Other rules you uh, were talking about, I think um, the captain's challenge is outstanding. And the reason is because tonight in that game at Gosford, um, Danny Levi went to the line by himself, you know, uh, disregarded the rest of his team, um, tried to score the, uh, and get across the line, dropped the ball, dropped the ball clearly in the tackle, got up and started blowing up. Now, I've already been critical of Ashley Klein um, performance tonight, but he got up blowing up saying, they stole it in the tackle and Ashley Klein said, you realise you can challenge it, don't you? And it yeah. immediately stopped Danny Levi in his tracks and the replay was very clear in that he dropped it cold. Perfect. Mm. Perfect. Mm. Put the onus back on the player. All right. You, now you're saying I make, made a mistake and you challenge it. He didn't and, and, and he can't say anything. Also, Jimmy, like I think for people now, people who are used to watching, you know, um, um, limited over cricket, or, uh, or or NBA and that sort of sport. And a rugby league game is a rugby league game is long, like like literally it is long. Like for me, I've got a very short attention span, right? And and I actually, unless it's really tight and there's like at least a good um, a good line break every set, um, you know, I get bored. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest, I get bored. So to me, um, um, the the captain's challenge makes me look up from my phone and go, oh. You know, oh, that's interesting. Do they do that today? You know, I really, you know, I, I think it really, it adds um, an extra um, distraction, an extra nuance for people who are easily bored, who've got short attention span. Yeah. And you know, the other one that does that too, and this is, this is where, you know, if you're playing basketball and you're down, down a basket and the other team's got the ball, you can steal the ball back, right? Previously in rugby league, um, given that you couldn't strike for the ball in the play the ball now, um, that scrum, challenging in a scrum, as we've spoken about earlier, that was a thing in the past. The one-on-one -on -one strip now gives the team with a minute remaining and down by two the opportunity to get the ball back and have a, have a, have a, a last attacking set as opposed to, oh, the other team just plays their five tackles and kicks downfield, which yeah, chews up yeah. 45 seconds. You know, that, and that, that, that's a good one. The thing we discussed in an earlier program, too, I think it was last week, was about blowouts and sure enough, it was after the Thursday night game, which was 59-0, and there were close games all weekend. Yes. But, but I think now the sample, the sample uh, is now big enough to say that um, the, the, the six again rule does not necessarily lead to um, uh, blowout score lines, but perhaps, perhaps it was responsible for them happening at first. And perhaps it will be in this country as well with the momentum um, you know, that, that it takes a while for a team to adjust. Um, not, only, not only momentum, but also uh, match fitness. Match fitness. Yeah. You know, we, we were looking at the, the first eight games of the first round going, oh, look at the impact this has. Players got tired. And then you go, yeah, they got tired because they hadn't played footy in 10 weeks. And no matter how much training yeah. you do and contact you do, it's just not the same as playing in a game. I want to take you to a minute before half time. They're running upfield, the Manly Warringah Seagulls. They're on about the 50 metre line. Their replacement hooker, Lachlan Croker, gets out of dummy half and gets whacked on the nose by Matt Lodge. He yep. does the, uh, the thing of valour and gets to his feet straight away and plays the ball. If I'm Des Hazler in the video session the next week, I'm pausing that there and say, Lachlan, in future, and everyone else in this room, stay down. Because they would have clearly got the penalty for being hit by Matt Lodge 
um, they would have had a kick for touch and the last 50 seconds to attack the line leading into half time. In the end, it was the Broncos who had the last set going in and they, they put up a kick for Xavier, Xavier Coates. But um, it's funny when you see that, when you see it turn full circle, when, like when you see it before and you go, oh, he's just staying down for the penalty. And now he didn't. You go, oh, why didn't he stay down for the penalty? Um, tough to win for these guys. By the way, Xavier Coates, star is born. Yeah, yeah, he was he was great. He was great. Um, uh, that's isn't it interesting though the way we discuss staying down. Now there was a game last week and I can't remember who the player was, uh, but he drew a penalty uh, by staying down. And and the commentators made one comment. Oh, he's all right now, and that's it. Didn't dwell on it. Ten years ago we dwelled on it, didn't we? We yeah. kind of accept a degree of gamesmanship now that we didn't accept. That's what. I, yeah, I was upset that Lock and Croker had no gamesmanship in him. Where's your gamesmanship? <laughs> Surely, what's having you not been listening to Des Hasler? Yes, so, yes, yeah. I thought that was uh, I thought that was a, a big part of it, a uh, big part of it. Um, all right, give us an update. RFL, when are we when are we back? Are we still looking at August for Super League? Uh, yeah, Jimmy, I, I have to um, go on what's in the public arena, and uh, the public are, in the public arena, they're saying that uh, August is is still the uh, date for for Super League. And that there's very much a division on whether um, the uh, uh, Championship and League One come back at all. Uh, Derek Beaumont, the owner of, uh, of um, uh, Lee, uh, was quite scathing in his criticism of the um, RFL this week in regard to what is the definition of a meaningful season. What is, and, and they're trying to get a definition out of the RFL. How many rounds is that? Um, you know what? You know, and there is obviously no international sport. There's uh, teams in um, the top two divisions now that are overseas. Uh, so that also complicates things. Look, the Championship and League One seem no closer to returning, to be honest. Uh, Super League does seem closer to returning. And it's just a question of, um, you know, under what rules, uh, what competition structure, uh, how long, how many times will the teams play each other? How does that intersect with, uh, you know, Challenge Cup, uh, Super League Grand Finals, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. So um, there's still a lot to discuss. But, um, yeah, Championship League One doesn't seem to have moved very much since we last spoke about this. I think they're looking at a Super League Grand Final on the 29th of November, right? That's... It's one of three options, Jimmy. It's, one, you know, one, it's been, that has been uh, published. It's, it's the another... earliest of three options, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. If, you look yeah, at, so... if, you, if you look at this collective bargaining agreement between the players and the league in Australia, I'm not sure what it's like in England, but there's generally um, an eight-week break. So if you look at last week in November, and I reckon this year the first Super League game was late yeah, January. Beginning of, yeah, well, it was the last day of January, the first day of yeah. uh, February. So, yeah, it's certainly going to have an impact on next year. And, let's, this is, and this is worth us mentioning. And then it can't have too much an impact on next season because the World Cup is next year. The World Cup has set dates. And we just had uh, – in it's five – it's. 499 days to go now mm. until the kick off the World Cup. Yep. They announced some new branding yesterday. They also announced where the teams are going to be based. Australia and England will both be based uh, in Manchester. And uh, in the middle of July, we're actually going to have the draw. We're going to have the actual matches. So uh, um, all the, all, most of the teams are based in, in the north. Uh, there's, I think one of, one of the teams is based, not the men's teams, is based uh, here in London. And um, they're pushing on with... Um, you know, they're pushing on with the World Cup and, and everything they're doing is top notch. And, um, and that is going to impact both Australia and the UK, both Super League and the NRL on their planning for next year because there's a certain cutoff point there. Um, so, uh, well, yeah, remains to be seen. Uh, just to let you know, too, the AFL kicked off tonight as well, two weeks after the NRL. Um, by the way, the NRL How's got... the crowd? <laughs> Did we uh, outdraw one... them? No, 177, I believe. <laughs> no, I don't know. I made that up. So, um, uh, but um, Richmond, the the premiers were involved. Um, I think it was Collingwood. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, the, the the reason I wanted to make note of it was that they've done it without a signing off of a broadcast deal. So that is interesting in that they're, they're playing, but they don't know how much money they're playing with the AFL. Um, and that means Seven and Fox haven't come to the table yet and decided what they're going to pay them. 
Jimmy, um, I just have to go for one second. Just one second. Okay, Steve Mascord, uh, ladies and gents, uh, taking off. Clearly, there's been a knock at the door. Um, uh, I hope he's doing, doing the so correct thing, which is asking who at, who is at the door. Uh, the old stranger danger things. Um, Steve, from what I understand, you become a bad role model to my children because we always ask them if there's someone knocking on the door or the doorbell rings, please ask who it is. Um, and I don't think I heard you ask who that was there at the door. No, well, I'll tell you, the situation here in, in England is if you don't, if a package comes and you don't answer the door, it goes back to the depot and it could be a week before you get it. Right. So it's, it's um, yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry about that. I wouldn't have answered, I, would have, I wouldn't have got up and, um, and done that. But, okay, um, well, well that, that begs the next question then. What, yeah. what, what is the anticipated package? What are we talking about there? Oh, it's probably not for me. It's probably for my wife. Yeah. Right. So you didn't even know what the package was. You, you just knew that you didn't want it to go back to base. That's right. That's all I knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and all I did was open the door. I didn't even like, I think I was supposed to like, I don't know, I was supposed to do something, but I just opened the door. Didn't so sorry, for... sorry, viewers and listeners. Sorry. No, that's okay. I was wafting, waffling on. So uh, yes, no, so no AFL, no AFL deal sign, which is interesting. Yeah, so no AFL TV deal beyond what year? Uh, so they haven't they haven't done a, a renegotiation. So they're still at twenty twenty two, and they're still looking at um, a, a reduction twenty twenty one, a reduction twenty twenty two, and they're thinking um, north of a hundred million dollar deduction for season twenty twenty, um, and they're looking at. Uh, so I think they make it about 417 million from their broadcast deal per annum. Um, they're looking at a sub $300 million figure. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Well, obviously Peter Volandi's, uh, you know, the numbers indicate, well, the situation and the indicator, he did a great job um, in a year's time uh, when we compare the two codes and, and, you know, if the AFL have renegotiated, I guess that's when the judgment will come. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know what? I think the, the classic, the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush at the moment because um, it was going to be really interesting the next broadcast deal anyway, um, let alone with COVID-19. So um, I think the fact that Peter Valenti is able to go back to the club and say, I will guarantee you this money over this period of time is tremendous. Um, and if it means, you know, shedding, shedding a bit of the excess uh, um, Rugby League Central, then so be it. Um, because now he can ask the clubs to do anything, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and they, they will and should fall into line. Rest of the weekend, Jimmy, what are you looking forward to? Uh, I think this game tomorrow night is going to be a real classic. The Eels versus the Panthers, both unbeaten sides. Um, Panthers haven't really impressed me. Um, I'm still not a believer in the Eels, but I reckon Mitchell Moses versus Nathan Cleary is going to be a good one. Nathan's back. Um, he's after not isolating himself. <laughs> he was then forced into isolation. Um, but now he's back and playing. Um, he was the incumbent New South Wales halfback for the first two games. Last year, Mitchell Moses has been playing really, really good footy. Um, and, and the beauty of it is they're now determining outcomes for their team, right? You either win or lose on the back of Mitchell playing well or, or Nathan playing well. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to that game. Anything grab your attention in particular? Yeah, um, Newcastle, Melbourne, uh, for me, really looking forward uh, to that one. I um, think Newcastle have been, uh, you know, really impressive at times, uh, this year and, and since they came back uh, and uh, Melbourne uh, uh, still still the quality side so I, I, I just there's a lot of uncertainties I guess when you're looking at what game interests you most you kind of like I, you look back to recent form lines and and you look for uncertainties things that you, things that you sort of uh, um, to complicate any any prediction and I, I certainly I'm not sure what, who to tip in that one I really yeah. I really find that one a hard one to tip Calen Ponger called the game last week with Calen Ponger and he was, I think, of, of six tries, he was involved in five of them, scored a couple, um, final passes and a um, couple of kicks and, yeah, he, he just an out-and-out out star. Benji was dropped. Hmm. Did you have a take on that? I was surprised. Yeah, I was just really surprised. Uh, Benji seems to often get himself in a situation where he... 
it, it, it get, he's, he gets dropped symbolically, you know, like the Kiwis. And, and I think it's happened a number of times in his career where it's not just about him. It's kind of about something bigger than him, uh, I guess, because he's a larger than life kind of player. Um, I didn't look at his stats last week, um, Jimmy. Uh, maybe they were terrible, but um, I didn't think he played that badly last week. I thought the, the try they scored uh, was amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, it was one of the best tries, uh, you know, West Tigers. And uh, yeah, I just, I just, I don't know. I, I, I was really surprised. And um, if he was a, a run of the mill, you know, first grader, if he was Josh Reynolds, for instance, would he have been dropped on that performance last week? I, I don't know. What do you think? You know, uh, I think um, he made a really tough call, Michael Maguire. And we've got to remember, this is the guy who, dragged Benji back to the international stage for rugby league seven years yeah, yeah. Uh, after he last played. Um, so, you know, there's clearly a, a bond there that he said, no, nah, your performance wasn't good enough. And I think there probably was a little bit of symbolism to it, to, to everyone else yeah, in the West yeah. Tiger squad saying, I don't care who you are. If your effort's not up to scratch, then then I'm going to drop you. And, and that's what he did. He's been letting, he, he's, you know, so there's three parts to the game for Benji Marshall, right? There's the attack part. No problem. There's the defence part, problem. And then there's the game management part, which uh, you lead by 12, you lead by 10. You've got to win those games if your game managers yeah. are looking after you. And, and he didn't do that. Um, he's led in eight tries in four games. So that's that through the, him. Yeah, so that's the defence side yeah. of things. So, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, As I said, I didn't, I didn't, you know, maybe the viewers uh, you know, disagree with me or listeners. But um, I didn't finish watching that game and go, "Geez, Benji's had a shocker." You know what I mean? Like it wasn't yeah. it wasn't a thought that was in my in my mind. Maybe it was in yours. It clearly, you know, must have been in Michael's. Yeah, absolutely. Stay well, mate. I reckon we're done. Yes. We're back next week, and we'll, we almost had guests on this week, so it was a last minute thing. So we'll try to plan a bit more than four and a half minutes ahead uh, next week, and we'll, that would uh, be we'll most unlike we'll us. Uh, and all being well, we might have a guest on next week. But um, we're, we went out on an extra platform today. Uh, we went out on Twitch as well as Facebook. Next week, we might try to add LinkedIn or something like that. Um, so we're, we're, like everyone, we're preparing for the return of uh, in, uh, Super League, which uh, we've got a, obviously a big vested interest in. And uh, we're, we're back in training. Apparently, rugby league's big on Twitch, right? Is that what you were telling me? The rugby league has the rugby league in uh, the UK. I'm pointing to the north now. Rugby league um, has a has, a, has a, a, it, the women's game is, is shown on Twitch. They do have a Twitch channel, so uh, yeah, uh, um, and probably you know NRL, uh, you know the computer games. That, that's big on Twitch. I would imagine. But, yeah. um, the, we're you know, we're big on Twitch now. The, the other thing, uh, when Lamelo Ball was playing for the Illawarra Hawks in the NBL, that yeah. was blowing up big time on Twitch. Oh, there you go. Yeah, awesome. yeah. So he he Where did um, he had a uh, he had a triple double in a game, and they had the highlights of the game on the Illawarra Hawks website. They had seven million views. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go, and now the Hawks are out of business. This now they're out of business. Thing. They were hoping Lamella. <laughs> they were hoping Lamella was going to buy them. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. Good stuff, mate. Stay well. Have a good weekend, everybody. See you next week.